Marbury v. Madison showed the Supreme Court had the power to void federal law that ran afoul of the U.S. Constitution. But what about state law that ran against the Constitution? Could the court void state laws as it could federal legislation? My name is Matthew Collum, and here on Law & History, we're going to examine the landmark case of Fletcher v. Peck. The Yazoo land scandal of 1795 was the product of fevered land speculation, political corruption, and good old-fashioned American greed. It was also the impetus for the case that expanded judicial review to state legislatures, reinforced the contract clause, and helped pave the way for America's westward expansion. Before we jump into the case itself, we need some historical background to provide some context to the court's decision. Officially founded in 1732 by James Oglethorpe as a debtor's colony, Georgia was the poorest of the 13 colonies and entered the Union as its poorest state. The state was largely undeveloped. For example, Savannah was its only significant city, and most of the places that were developed were confined to the coast. But what the state lacked in economic development, it more than made up for in economic potential, largely in the form of that undeveloped land. At this time, Georgia stretched from the Atlantic all the way to the Mississippi River. The land that would soon be called the Yazoo Tract spanned from Georgia's Chattahoochee west to the Mississippi. The bulk of this land would eventually become the states of Alabama and Mississippi. Of course, the Yazoo Tract may have been undeveloped by American standards, but it was far from unpopulated. Numerous Native American tribes lived in the area, including the Choctaw and Chickasaw to name just a few. A smattering of European settlers and frontiersmen lived there as well, and this is to say nothing regarding the competing Spanish and British claims on the area. In 1789, a group of businessmen, land speculators, and politicians, including Patrick Henry, tried to buy the Yazoo Tract. In the 1780s, Georgia had unsuccessfully tried to settle land deep in the Yazoo. However, the Native American nations there were still quite vibrant and doomed that project to failure. After that failure, the Georgian strategy seems to have embraced the privatization of westward expansion into the Yazoo. And, of course, we can't discount the influence of Eli Whitney's cotton gin. That invention would make cotton and slavery immensely profitable, and his business partners saw the possibilities of developing the cotton-friendly soil of the Yazoo. And to that end, they made common cause with the 1789 group of speculators and paid some visits to some Georgia politicians. In 1795, the state legislature passed the Yazoo Act. This legislation sold the 35 million acre Yazoo tract to just four companies. The Georgia Company, the Georgia Mississippi Company, the Upper Mississippi Company, and the Tennessee Company. The entire tract sold for $500,000, just a half a million bucks, which amounted to something like 1.42 cents per acre. Even in 1795, this was considered extraordinarily cheap. In fact, this bargain basement sale was the product of bribery and corruption. The year before, in 1794, the interested individuals of the companies just mentioned bought Georgia Governor George Matthews' influence and the state legislature's votes, ensuring the act's passage. One year later, the legislature passed the Repeal Act of 1796. This was largely in response to public outrage at the corruption that created the 1795 Act. This newly seated legislature was made up of freshly elected representatives eager to prove their fidelity to the rule of law and honesty. The optics of the moment even included a ceremonial burning of the 1795 Act. They did this using a sunglass to focus, as they termed it, heaven's light to immolate the earthly corruption. Regardless of the 1796 Act, land speculation continued at breakneck speed. The four companies quickly subdivided and sold their tracts to unsuspecting buyers all over the U.S. Eventually, a tract of land found its way into the hands of one Robert Fletcher, and we'll speak more on him later in the video. So that's the 30,000 foot view. Let's take a closer look at the facts of the case itself. As I mentioned, shortly after the 1795 Act, the Yazoo Tract grantees began subdividing and flipping their parcels. Often, they sold their land to out-of-state buyers. These individuals may or may not have been aware of the scandal surrounding the Yazoo, but regardless, money was pouring in. Despite the Repeal Act and its corny symbolism, in 1801, a portion of the Yazoo Tract ended up in John Peck's possession. Now, Peck was a director in the New England Mississippi Land Company. And in early 1803, Peck sold some land, something like 15,000 acres, to Robert Fletcher for 
Now, in late 1803, Fletcher sued Peck in Massachusetts Circuit Court to rescind the land sale contract. Fletcher argued Peck never had title to the land at issue and was therefore in breach of the land sale contract. Fletcher alleged that Peck had sold him land that he never held title to, and he wanted that three grand back. In 1807, the Circuit Court finally ruled for Peck. The land sale was valid. Georgia's 1796 Repeal Act was not. Fletcher, of course, appealed the ruling to the U.S. Supreme Court, and it would issue its opinion three years later. At base, this was a contract dispute over a land sale. So the language used in this conflict was that of property law. And as in any conveyance of land from one party to another, a deed was exchanged for the purchase price. The deed Peck conveyed to Fletcher contained several covenants the breach of which would have been sufficient to rescind the land sale. In 1810, the court took up Fletcher's case. He advanced four arguments against Peck, each one built around an alleged breach of a covenant contained in the deed conveyed to Fletcher. These arguments can be summarized as, one, the Georgia legislature lacked the power to grant the Yazoo Tract. Two, the 1795 act was a nullity because it was a product of political corruption. Three, any, quote, Yazoo contract entered into was invalid by virtue of the Georgia legislature's incapacity. And four, the Yazoo tract belonged to the federal government, not Georgia. Let's examine each of these arguments in a little bit more detail. In Fletcher's first argument, he stated the Georgia legislature lacked the power to grant the Yazoo tract. The deed's second covenant provided that the state of Georgia had the right to, quote, sell and dispose of the land at issue. Fletcher, however, argued that the 1795 Georgia legislature lacked the power to sell the land. On review, the court held that the Georgia legislature did, in fact, have the power to pass the 1795 Act granting the Yazoo Tract. It said that it could, quote, perceive no restriction on the legislative power which inhibited the passage of the Act of 1795. Unquote. In short, the Georgia State Constitution did not forbid the legislature from acting as it had, and therefore it had the power to do what it did. Fletcher's second argument claimed Peck breached the deed's third covenant. That third covenant stated that when Georgia conveyed legal title to Peck, it conveyed, quote, all the title ever held by it. Distilled to its essence, Fletcher argued that the Georgia law, which granted the legislature the authority to dispose of the Yazoo tract, resulted from corruption, thereby making the law a, quote, nullity and void. Upon review of Fletcher's reasoning, however, the court held that, provided the legislature validly enacted the law, it cannot be a nullity. The court reasoned that, and I'm quoting here, if the title at issue be deduced from a legislative act, such as the 1795 Act, which the legislature might constitutionally pass, if the act be clothed with all the requisite forms of a law, a court cannot sustain a suit brought by one individual against another founded on the allegation that the act is a nullity in consequence of the impure motives which influence certain members of the legislature. We can sum up the court's argument as, so long as the legislature passed legislation in a manner publicly appropriate to that task, it does not matter how it was done privately. It's a bit like Otto von Bismarck's thoughts on legislation and sausage making. When he said, laws are like sausages, it's better not to see how they're being made. Moreover, Peck was not in breach of the deed's third covenant. The Georgia legislature had conveyed all the title it had in the land to him via the deed. Fletcher's third argument claimed that Peck breached the deed's fourth covenant, which stated that title to the land had, quote, been in no way constitutionally or legally impaired by any subsequent Georgia law. Fletcher argued that the Repeal Act of 1796 did just that, thereby placing Peck in breach of the Fourth Covenant. This is also the legal argument uh, that made Fletcher v. Peck a notable case among legal scholars. The court relied on principles found in equity and constitutional interpretation to invalidate the 1796 Repeal Act. The land at issue had passed from the original parties those being Georgia and the grantees involved in the original four companies, into the possession of third parties, like Fletcher and Peck. The court applied principles found in courts of equity to show that even if, quote, the original transaction was infected with fraud, 
And remember, the fraud alleged was in the form of political corruption. These third-party purchasers did not participate in it and had no notice of it. They were innocent." Unquote. The court then turned to a bit of constitutional interpretation. It prefaced its analysis by noting that Georgia was, quote, a part of a large empire, a member of the American Union, and that union has a constitution, the supremacy of which all acknowledge, and which imposes limits to the legislature of the several states, which none claim a right to pass, unquote. Then Marshall cited Article 1, Section 10, Clause 1, the Contract Clause, which states in relevant part, quote, no state shall pass any law impairing the obligation of contracts, unquote. The court then applied the contract clause to the 1795 grant, which it construed as a contract between parties. If the original conveyance from Georgia to the four companies was a contract, and third parties had relied upon that fact to enter into agreements of their own with those grantees, then the Repeal Act of 1796 was a clear violation of the contract clause. That act sought to abrogate both the 1795 grant and any subsequent contracts made in reliance on it, stating that the 1795 act was never valid law. The 1796 Repeal Act was simply a bridge too far. It violated the contract clause and could not withstand judicial scrutiny regarding its constitutionality. The invalidation of this law also represented the first time the court applied its power of judicial review to state legislation, thus expanding the doctrine's scope and the court's power. Fletcher's final argument rested upon an interpretation of historical fact. In 1763, King George III issued a proclamation forbidding English settlement west of the Appalachian Ridgeline. British claims in North America extended from the Atlantic to the Mississippi River. Under the proclamation, the land between the coasts and the mountains was reserved for British settlement while the land between the Appalachians and the Mississippi was reserved for the Native Americans. In 1763, the land that would comprise the Yazoo Tract was part of the so-called Indian Reserve. Fletcher argued that Peck breached the deed's first covenant, which stated that Georgia was, quote, sized in fee of the soil in the Yazoo Tract subject only to the extinguishment a part of the Indian title thereon. Fletcher argued by virtue of the proclamation of 1763 that the Yazoo Tract belonged to the federal government and not to Georgia. The court dismissed Fletcher's argument that the Yazoo Tract was federal land. Instead, the court reasoned that the reserve was a, quote, temporary arrangement suspending for a time the settlement of the country set aside, but that by 1795, that land was firmly under Georgia's jurisdiction and authority. Further, the court expressly stated that the landed issue was located, quote, within the state of Georgia and that the state had the power to grant it. Bear in mind, however, the court would more fully address the issue of Native American title to land in the 1823 case of Johnson v. McIntosh. Jurists remember this case as the first one in which the Supreme Court struck down a state law as unconstitutional. It refined the court's powers of judicial review after the 1803 case of Marbury v. Madison and reinforced the quasi-sanctity of contract law. There is ample evidence that the parties in this case deliberately sought to bring the case before the Supreme Court in order to obtain a precedent making land speculation less vulnerable to populist or partisan legal surprises. This ruling made land speculation in the Yazoo Tract far more concrete and led, in large part, to the creation of Alabama and Mississippi. It also provided legal certainty to speculative claims in America's vast western interior and would help drive the new country westward. This would have obvious consequences for everyone living in North America. If you've made it this far, thank you. Please give the video a like, leave a comment, and subscribe to the channel. Be sure to check back often for more content, and uh, have a great day.